a couple of verses on there. If you don't have one, can you raise your hand? I'd like to hand it to you. Okay. I'd like to get that to you. I'll get you one too, Andrew. Anybody else? Okay. Yep. Thanks. Everybody else got one? Okay. So if you thought you were done with school, you're not. <laughs> Study to show yourself approved. It's one of the verses in 2 Timothy 2. But this is a verse uh, of some verses that I would like us to try to memorize maybe while we're this week, uh, here this week. It's from 2 Timothy 2, verses 11 through 13. So uh, at least whenever I'm up here, I'll try to get you to say it together, uh, say it together and see if we can memorize it. It's pretty short. And I uh, just want to clarify, this is a paraphrase. It's not an exact translation, but it's pretty close. And it's a paraphrase in modern language. Uh, I studied a few different translations and wrote it out myself. Uh, so I want to add that uh, for clarity. But I believe the truth in it is still just as powerful. And I think uh, is the, the intent of the writer, intent of the Holy Spirit and the writer Paul to Timothy. So let's say this together. We'll say the reference and then read that those lines and then say the reference again. That helps me uh, memorize. I don't know how if you have little memorization tricks. So uh, together. Second Timothy 2 verses 11 through 13. If we die with him, we shall live with him. If we remain in him, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. When we feel like giving up, he does not give up on us because that's who he is faithful 2 Timothy 2 11 through 13 so powerful words and I hope you carry that with you I, I, I printed it out on a sheet that's small enough that you can keep in your Bible or in your pocket or something in your wallet and remind yourself of it often if we die with him you will all have already faced opportunities to die today I believe and will to die is to deny yourself of that which will exalt your own human life, your reputation, your looks, your, what people think of you. And you're all, you and I are always being faced with the decision of will you die or will you not? Will you decide to try to defend yourself and preserve yourself? Then you're trying to live. But if you die, you will truly live with him. Jesus showed that by his example. If we remain in Him, if we remain in Him, we will reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will deny us. That's a stern warning. And these powerful words at the end, when you feel like giving up, I, I believe that's what it means is when we are faithless, when we're lacking in faith, it could mean the unbelievers as well, if you, if you look at the Greek, but I believe for us believers, for those, those of us who are children of God, who, who really believe and find our faith lacking when there's less faith. That's what my New American translation reads. When you're faithless, that means you have less faith in a situation. When you feel like giving up, He does not give up on you. Because that's who He is. It's His, per, it is his character. He cannot deny Himself when you're faithless. Because He's faithful. That's His character. So we'll, we'll keep looking at that. Now, I would like to continue a little bit on the, the topic of the, of the soldier that Phil talked on earlier this morning. And one of the words that comes to my mind when I think about the word soldier is this word abandon. Now, I'm not sure if it's, if, if it's it, to some extent, it's, it's true about soldiers who defend the United States. They have abandoned themselves to their country, which means their family is affected if they are married, their wife is affected, or their husband if it's a woman. Their children, if they have children, those are, they're affected by it. Their parents, their brothers and sisters, at any moment face the, the, uh, the possibility that a representative of the U.S. military could come ring their doorbell and say, I'm sorry, ma'am, I'm sorry, sir, your son or daughter has died in battle and I have bad news or is badly injured. They have abandoned themselves for the sake of their country. Now, if you look at the other countries, like uh, the jihadists, I think they ought to be the best examples for us of what it means to be a soldier. I mean, these people, suicide bombers, jihadists, 
in the Islamic countries give their physical bodies. I mean, they, they, they're not interested in girlfriends and, and, all, and all this other stuff. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to exalt that religion. You know what I'm trying, getting at. But there is a spiritual principle that when you look at how they act out in the physical, in the natural, how they're willing to strap a bomb to their body and say, I really could care less about my life. I believe in something greater. That ought to challenge us as Christians. Not in a way that condemns us, but say, Lord, this is the true message. This is the true gospel. You are the true God. And I ought to be living with that kind of abandon to you. My life, what is it, Lord? One day, I'm fully prepared for the Lord to call me to be one of his martyrs and say, they're going to kill you because you confess the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. But you know what's harder, my dear friends, my dear young people? It's harder for me to die to myself and my reputation and my looks and my, my, uh, uh, what people think of me and all those things. And I'm always concerned about that. I'm, I'm talking to you as a young person the age of, in, in their teenagers and in their 20-somethings and maybe even in your early 30s with the things that I struggled with. I struggled with how I looked and, 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 and what people thought of me and how I spoke and, and how I fit in in social circumstances and all those things. And at times I allowed those things to discourage me and to bring me down spiritually. But I hope you won't. And I hope you can learn from my example. And I'm thankful for the grace of God that brought salvation into my life. That I realized I don't have to be worried about those things anymore. And Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, you created me specifically the way I am. With the personality that I have, with the looks and the eyes and the nose and the hair and, or lack of it, like in my case, I'm losing it. All of that with a purpose to do something in my life. And I'll tell you what it's, it's doing for me when I'm living with that kind of abandon. Lord, you made me the way I am, and I'm available to you. Send me wherever you want me to go. Allow me to have something or not allow me to have something. I'm yours. I'm abandoned to you. I hope you know now what the meaning of that word abandon. Abandon quite simply means that you give yourself completely without any reservation. This is the only true Christian life, to live with abandon. Now, I want to read to you the testimony of somebody who lived with abandon. These are the words of uh, Elizabeth Elliot. If you know, heard of Elizabeth Elliot, I hope you have. If you haven't, please take some time to find out about her and her former husband who died, Jim Elliot. This is a book called Discipline, the, Gra the Glad Surrender. If you have a chance to read the book as well, wonderful book. Now, read, uh, here's an extract from this. This is actually from her journal. When I was in college, Elizabeth Elliot is writing, when I was in college, it was the custom, I want you to uh, take your eyes off your pad or whatever and just look at me because I really want you to pay attention to these words. This speaks so clearly to young people, to where you all are at, I believe with all my heart. When I was in college, Elizabeth Elliot writes, it was the custom when the yearbook came out to ask one's friends to autograph it. Usually they wrote a few words in addition to their signature. And when a girl asked for the autograph of a man she especially admired, you relate to that? When you ask for the autograph of a man you especially admire, or boys and girls, vice versa. When a girl asked for the autograph of a man she especially admired, she secretly hoped for some clue to his feelings towards her in the words he wrote. Because they were all spiritual people. This was at Wheaton College, where they went to college, a Christian, Christian university. And so they were all spiritual people. We, at least, at least they, they, they spoke spiritual language, and many of them were spiritual people. Uh, but they, you would hope that the person who was autographing it would give you some clue whether he likes you or not, whether she likes you or not, in, with a scripture reference to back it up. Okay, you, you relate to that. <laughs> well, Jim Elliot, whom she admired, and ended up marrying later on, signed his name in my Whedon Tower, which is the journal, and added only a scripture reference, 2 Timothy 2.4. And he wrote, this is what 2 Timothy 2.4 states. It wasn't what he wrote, he just wrote the reference, Jim Elliot reference. But this is what the reference reads. A soldier on active service will not let himself be involved in civilian affairs. He must be wholly at his commanding officer's disposal. He was a fool. 
I mean, you don't write someone like that if you're hoping to marry this girl. You don't say, I'm not interested in civilian matters and what's all this marriage business and lovey-dovey stuff. I mean, that's what he was saying. And it, perhaps. That's certainly how it could have been taken. He was a fool. He goes on. And, uh, Elizabeth Elliot continues in her journal. The message was loud and clear. Any hopes I might have entertained, any feelings Jim himself might have had for me that he had not at that time expressed must give way before the guiding principle of his life. What she's saying is she realized that Jim Elliot, even if he had feelings for her, even if he liked her with the intention of marrying her, he had to give way, those feelings had to give way for this dominating principle by which he seemed to live his life because he was a soldier. He was committed to God's army. And he says, I, I know, Elizabeth, that you, you, know, you might want to marry me and all that. Perhaps Jim is thinking this in his head. But you know what? I've got a calling. I'm abandoned to God. I can't just make a decision however I want on who I like and who I don't like and he's cute or she's cute. I'm abandoned to God. <clears throat> he was not at liberty, Elizabeth Elliot goes on to write, he was not at liberty to plan the future. Are you at liberty to plan your own future? He was not. Jim Elliot wasn't. Being at the disposal of someone else. You know, when I hear the word disposal, being at somebody's disposal, you know what I think of? I think of what, what we call the, the garbage disposal. In, a, in, in your kitchen, you probably have a garbage disposal. Are you prepared to be at God's disposal where you feel like he's putting you through the garbage disposal, through the grinder? in those circumstances and through those frustrating circumstances of your life. If so, you're at God's disposal. Jim Elliot was. Now, I'm setting the tone, and I, I don't have time to tell you Jim Elliot's story. But this man who seems like a fool and who was prepared to give up the opportunity to marry this godly woman who was beautiful too, I'm sure, and whom he probably felt an attraction to, but the fact that he was willing to give it up like a fool, the fact that he lived with abandon at God's disposal to be put through God's garbage disposal, as it were. It might seem like that. You know the end of his life, I'll, I'll, I'll spoil it for you, but I hope you'll still read the story. He was martyred in South America when he went to take the gospel to them. But the, the effect of his life and the fact that he, his physical life did go through the garbage disposal, and it might seem to, have, seem to the world like it was a waste, but the fruit of his life and his ministry is still relevant and uh, present in South America today. Because God has a greater purpose in mind. And if you're willing to abandon yourself to his purpose, you might never get that thing that you're interested in. You might not, your earthly desires may not be fulfilled, but God's desires for your life will be fulfilled. His purpose for his kingdom will be fulfilled through every single man or woman or child. And it doesn't matter how old you are if you live with that abandon. I invite you, my dear young person, don't waste, wait till you're 60 years old to abandon your life to God. Some people do that, and I'm not here to judge them. I'm determined today is the day of salvation. If you're 15, you might already be too old, I think. I'm not saying too old as in you can't. I'm saying start now. Yeah, you'll face bodily passions. Yeah, you'll face all those temptations that seem to be strongest in those late teen and early 20, 20 something years. But if you abandon yourself to God, oh, what he will do through you. Jim Elliot was in his 20s when he died. He wasn't an old 50, 60 year old man who lived for himself and then decided, you know what? Yeah, Lord, you can take the dregs of my life. He gave the best of his life to God and he went through the garbage disposal. And I think only in eternity we'll realize the eternal weight of glory that came through his life. And not just him. Paul, Phil quoted from 2 Timothy 4, about that crown of righteousness that was waiting for Paul. Paul went through the garbage disposal too. It's not convenient to have your head chopped off. That's what happened to Paul. Went through the garbage disposal. From an earthly standpoint, that's what happened. But you know that we read his letters, the squeezing, the fact that Paul went through the garbage disposal is why we even have the book of 2 Timothy today and Philippians and Romans and Corinthians and all those holy words of God today, inspired by God. These are men and their examples of women too. If you read the biographies of godly men and women, you'll see that. 
Elizabeth Elliot continues, he was not at liberty to plan the future, being at the disposal of someone else. Any soldier, any candidate for Christian discipline ought daily to report to his commanding officer for duty. Do you think any soldier out there in Iraq or in Afghanistan or somewhere else has the option to say, you know what, today I don't feel like fighting. I need a break. I'm just going to go to sleep in a little bit. Don't I get a weekend? There is no weekend if the military is shooting, uh, if the enemy is shooting at you, is there? It doesn't matter. I mean, the, the enemy doesn't care if it's Saturday or Sunday or Wednesday. There is no weekend for those who are abandoned to God. Now, I'm, I'm not saying he doesn't give us rest. But you're never at a point where you can just let down your guard and say, okay, at least today can I do what I want to do? Can I live for myself today since it's Saturday? Or it's a Sunday night, can I just watch that movie which I'd really love to watch or that TV program, even though I know that it would compromise my commitment to God? Let me do it once, Lord. Let me, let me look with lust just one time at that picture on the computer. Let me, let me speak that word harshly to that person just one time, just to let off some steam. If you're a soldier, you don't have that liberty to live for yourself. Any soldier, any candidate for Christian discipline ought daily to report to his commanding officer for duty. At your service, Lord. What the soldier does for the officer is not in the category of favor. The soldier is not doing his officer a favor by showing up for duty. And this is the mentality of a soldier who has understood what it means to follow Jesus. That I'm not doing Jesus any favors by showing up for duty and going out in the mission field if he sends you there and denying yourself. You're not doing God any favor. He is saving your soul by it. At your service, Lord, what the soldier does for the officer is not in the category of favor. The officer may ask anything. He disposes of the soldier as he chooses. They, the very thought strikes horror to the modern mind. The very thought of living the Christian life this way strikes horror to the, to the modern mind. And maybe it's striking horror into your mind. You mean this is real Christianity? Yes, it is, my friends. If you read God's word, not, not the words of Elizabeth Elliot, not my words, but if you read God's word, you will see this is true Christianity. And unfortunately, especially in the Western world, we've been shown a fake, a counterfeit that says that you can live for yourself and you can gain all the money you want and uh, have all the, and live for yourself and live for your pleasures and while you're young it's okay sleep around and, and do all this stuff and, and, and eventually you might get right and yeah you said that prayer and you made that altar call back when you were 18 so it's all good your name's in the book of life you're good to go don't worry about it man all this all this condemnation and legalism that people try to put on you there's a false gospel it's not even a gospel because gospel means good news it's not even false good news. There's no such thing as false good news, right? It's just false. False words, empty words that won't lead you to eternal life. But the true gospel is this, and I believe it with all of my heart. And I don't want to stand up here as one who has accomplished anything or reached anywhere in this. I feel like I've, I've just tasted a few drops. But I know those drops are leading me to the ocean. And there's an ocean out there of the true Christian life. And I'm tasting more and more of it day by day. Like we heard Phil earlier this morning as well. And I want you to also find that ocean of God's love and God's commitment and faithfulness. And uh, God being able to do marvel marvelous works in your life and through your life. Let's get to the ocean together, shall we? <clears throat> the officer may ask anything. He disposes of the soldier as he chooses. The very thought of this strikes horror to the modern mind. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Nobody has a right to dispose of me. Again, I'm, I'm just reading Elizabeth Elliot's words. This powerful thinking has its effect on Christians as well. So that we have come to imagine that discipleship is somehow an extra to the Christian life. There's Christianity, being saved, and then there's discipleship. Are you a disciple or are you a Christian? Well, there's no such thing. That's what she's saying in this letter. We have, convinced, we have come to imagine that discipleship is somehow an extra, an option. We suppose that we can be Christians going to church, saying our prayers, singing those sweet songs about loving and feeling and sharing and praising without taking our share of the hardship. I'll give you a copy of this if you'd like, and so you don't have to, you know, there's so much depth here. I, I probably just spend the whole time reading this letter. Uh, 
we suppose that we can be Christians going to church, saying our prayers, singing those sweet songs about loving and feeling and sharing and praising without taking our share of hardship. Those who wish to make a bid for special sainthood, we tell ourselves, they might try discipline. It has its place as though it were an odd or fanatical lifestyle. That's too radical. Not the thing for most of us. And unfortunately, what she said is true about most of Christendom in the world today, especially in a country like ours. It is as though we might be Christians without being disciples. It's a foolish way to live. But you know that famous saying of Jim Elliot's, her husband, he is no fool he who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. My dear brothers, my dear young, young people, dear young men and women, the world is striving to keep something, whether it's the girlfriend or the boyfriend or the car or the job or the money or the reputation or the looks or whatever. They're, they're striving to keep it. And you will look like a fool by saying, I refuse to dress that way. I'm going to wear this instead. And you will look the fool. I refuse to go to those R-rated movies with you, my friends, because I'm going to look like the fool. And you say, well, what's wrong with that? It's just two minutes of, a, uh, of, a, of an intimate sexual scene that will corrupt your mind for the rest of your life. What's so bad about that? It's R. It's, it's not pornography. It's R. Yeah, yeah, it's okay to watch it. What's wrong with that? And you'll look like a fool when you say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Or you'll be in the midst of your friends at work or in the school, and they'll start to tell a joke that's inappropriate and that's wrong and that's ungodly and you'll say please excuse me I've got to go you look like a fool he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose and every time my dear friend you go into the ground and die God makes a note of it that little child of mine gained something that nobody can take away from them you know that, that when you die and when you deny yourself, nobody, I mean, the devil will try to take it. Even the devil with all his powers cannot rob that from you because God is preserving it in his hand. He's preserving your life in his hand. So don't corrupt yourself. Don't, don't corrupt yourself now for those little earthly temporary pleasures. It'll feel good for a few moments, but you cannot keep it. You might be able to keep it even if you're really lucky till the end of your life. In most cases, you won't even be able to keep it that long. But at the end of your life gone and you don't know when that end of your life is do you it could be in a few minutes most people who were not prepared everybody who was not prepared to die came death came sooner than they thought but when you die and you live this life of denial and you give up your will daily and you take up your cross and say lord i will do it you give me the grace and i fell i, I, I slipped up that time but lord there's my cross again i'm going to get underneath it and pick it up and you're going to give me grace let's do this together i'm going to take your yoke upon me that jesus himself is carrying he doesn't call you to carry a cross that he himself has not already carried and he's carrying it with you and he's on the other side of that yoke and he says come with me learn from me Take my yoke upon you, he says in Matthew 11. That's a yoke. Have you pictured that the cross that you're bearing, Jesus is also helping you bear? Now, you, you will feel some of the weight. It's not that you don't feel any of the weight. It's not like, well, Jesus had all the suffering for my sake. I don't have to suffer anymore. No, he calls you to suffer. You will feel a little bit of that weight, but you know it won't be heavier than you can handle. Why? Because he's got the heaviest part of it all. He's bearing the yoke for everyone. And he, it'll, that yoke will never come crashing down on you. That cross will never be too much for you to bear because Jesus proved it wasn't. Even when his father forsook him on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the worst thing anybody can ever go through in their life. I mean, it's worse than rape. It's worse than the, uh, uh, just uh, uh, decapitation and dismemberment. All of those things are nothing compared to what Jesus suffered on the cross. Proving that nothing we experience on this earth, no sacrifice, no pain, no uh, denial of your will is too great that God cannot give you grace to bear it. That's why he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overcome you except such as is common to man and especially common to that foremost man of all, the Son of Man, Jesus. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape. And you might find that the fires are getting too hot. There you are in that workplace and that seductive woman wants to come and chat with you because she thinks you're cute. And you know she's not a child of God and you know the spirit and what she's trying to reach out to you with those texts and all that stuff and you will find an exit door. 
And you'll find the tongue of the Holy Spirit saying, take that door, get out of here. Flee. Don't wait a moment. Don't even reply to that text. It's not worth it. Run. If you take it, you will realize that there was no temptation that was too much to bear. But if you sit there and you think you can handle it, I remember once Brother Zach, Zach was up here and he o- opened up something for me. It says, resist the devil. Phil talked about that. But flee temptation. <laughs> Don't try to resist temptation. If a woman comes up to you, young man, and you know the spirit in it, and you sense that your heart is being tugged in a way that it shouldn't be, flee. Don't try to resist it. Young sister, if a boy comes up to you and you find that temptation there and you know it's not right and the Holy Spirit's convicting you, flee. Run. That's what Paul tells Timothy. You know, Timothy was about 40 years old when Paul told him that. When he writes to him there, flee youthful lusts. 40-year-old Timothy. How much more you and I? Well, I'm 40 now, so. (laughs) Okay. I'm getting off track, but that's all right. Um, I have these verses up there on the uh, next slide. I'll put it up. Yeah, those, those, that's what I wanted to show you. 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. These are a few different paraphrases. I'll just read them quickly. Endure your share of suffering as a first-class soldier. Don't be one of those drags. You know, so every army probably has a few drag soldiers. They're like, they're dead weight. When the battalion's moving, there's always the, the guy or the person in the back who's just, man, I'm, I'm out of shape and I ate too much. and I, I, I'm slowing down the whole battalion. Why? Because I was lazy and I didn't keep my body fit. Don't be one of those. Be one of those first-class soldiers at the start of the line. Don't get entangled in the enterprises of civilian life. Now, this is important because we have to live civilian lives. We have to work in this world. We have to earn a living. We have to interact with men and women, with people of the opposite sex. We have to interact with the world. But he says, don't get entangled. Don't get stuck there. That's what entangled is. Don't get stuck there. Don't have a foot in in the mire while you're trying to walk. Don't let it put put a, a chain around you with a heavy ball attached to it this world that you're interacting with. Don't let there be any person that could hinder you from an intimate, passionate devotion to Jesus, especially if they're of the opposite sex. Be holy at your commanding officer's disposal. That's the, I think that's a new English uh, Bible that Elizabeth Elliot quoted from, that, that paraphrase. Be holy at your commanding officer's disposal. And this is the message paraphrase in the last one. A soldier on duty doesn't get caught up in making deals at the marketplace, whether it's financially or emotionally or um, physically. No, you're not making deals in the world's marketplace, young person, because you're a soldier. He concentrates on carrying out orders. That's why Paul could say in Galatians 1, 17, I think... 17 or so, maybe 10. Uh, If I seek to please men, I cannot be the servant of Christ. Make it your only aim, dear brother, dear young sister. And if you can start young to please, please your master, make that your only aim in life. He will fulfill the desires of your heart and all your needs, your needs for marriage. I know that's probably one of the foremost things in your mind if you're still single at this age. Will I get married and who will it be and what will that look like? All those things. I know that's foremost. Or maybe it's money or maybe it's your job or maybe it's where you're going to live and who's going to take care of it. Maybe it's your relationship with your parents or friends around you and how you seem to be like the outcast and you don't know how to fit in and all these things. God will take care of all of those, my dear brother, dear sister. Take comfort in that. But you live this life and he will. You will get that which nobody can steal from you. You know, I used to, uh, you know that, that phrase in, in uh, Luke where Jesus says, the, the fields are ripe for harvest, but the laborers are few. I always thought of the laborers as the people that go out there and do the work in, in the field. And I think that's probably what Jesus meant. But I remember a few months ago that the meaning of that word came to me in a much more powerful way. And this was around the time when m- my youngest child, Vienna, was going to be born in the few hours preceding her birth. And there we were in the hospital room, and Megan was going through what you call labor, pre-birth labor. And all of a sudden, the Lord reminded me of that word, she's a laborer. Have you seen laboring in God's kingdom this way? And oh, it's painful. I mean, I watched her go through that, and I I longed. I even prayed this. I said, Lord, let me take half her pain. I'll take all of her pain, in fact. I, I think I can handle it. Please don't let her go through it. I wished I could somehow take the pain that she was going through. But you know that can't be done. 
God ordained for women to bear children through pain in, in their childbirth. And I don't fully understand all of that. But it was painful. Oh, she was, there was tears and there was, I mean, she squeezed my hand so hard I had nail marks in my skin because she was in so much pain. I mean, you know, you probably, if you've seen a woman in birth, you know, in labor, you know what it's like. It's not easy. It's painful. But there's something that kept her going. There was life at the other end of it. There was a joy that was to come at the end of the morning. At the end of the night, there was going to be a morning. There was going to be what we call Vienna today. That little girl that brings so much joy to our, our lives and our hearts. There was life going to come out of it. This is a laborer. God is looking for laborers through whom he can birth his work in Christ. Laborers through whom he can birth. This is not, okay, Lord, uh, you, you give me $10, I'll go work for you for an hour. You give me $100, I'll work for five hours. This, that's, it's not that kind of labor. This is, you, you won't get any payment out of it, but you'll have the life of Christ come out of you. It'll hurt. And you might think it'll never end. I mean, in some cases, labor lasts for days. Oh, 48 hours, 60 hours. When is just, when is it going to end, Lord? I feel like this is just unending. This is not going to happen. I, maybe the baby will die. And there's all this uncertainty that goes through a parent's mind when the child is trying to come through. But we have a confidence that this child will not die. The life of Christ has already been proved triumphant. He has already conquered the grave. You don't have to worry about it. You just say, Lord, you can take me. I'm one of your laborers. Send me through those pains of childbirth, spiritually speaking now. And you let the Lord take you through those squeezing circumstances. And He doesn't promise you that it'll just be two hours or two years or 20 years. He doesn't tell you the end from the beginning. But He says, if you see my word by faith, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, He says in Hebrews 11.1. That means I don't see when this trial is going to end. I don't see how and when God is going to fulfill my, the promise. But I know He is because His word is true. Let God be true. Every man a liar. And the devil will tell you all kinds of lies to, to contradict what God has said in His word. Don't let Him. Don't believe Him. That's why Paul could say in 2 Timothy 2 that He endured for the sake of the chosen. He endured all things. I mean, it's like, Paul, you want to take me through distress? Paul had to swim in the deep for many days, days and nights. He endure, endured the 39 lashes, it says. And you read how, how he writes there to the Corinthians, I think, of how this, all the suffering that he went through. He says, Lord, I'm at your disposal. I know that if you force me to, to have to swim in the deep water after my boat was shipwrecked because I was on my way somewhere to give the gospel to somebody, you will not allow me to die unless it's your time for me to come. It's, it's your time for me to come home. And then I'll, welcome, I'll, I'll run to your presence, Lord. But if you find yourself in the deep, Paul calls it the deep, and he's swimming and swimming and he's barely treading water and he thinks, man, one of these days I'm not going to make it. Continue on, believe in God. That's why I have that verse that I put. When you find your faith failing, he cannot deny himself. He is faithful. But you must live like that other verse, Philippians 3. You must live like Paul. He says, he's, I count my life as nothing, as, as, as manure. I mean, that's, he says, my life, my reputation, my honor, my, my, what's in it for me and who's going to look out for me, that's like a pile of manure. I don't care about that. I care about Christ. And I've forsaken all of these things for the sake of Christ. You know, that's the spirit in which Jesus came to this earth. What did Jesus lack when he came to this earth? If you think about going into, uh, uh, going into the, let's say you're feeling challenged, says, yes, Lord, I'll do this and you'll give me all these other things because there is a God, there is a message that's being preached in churches today that says, if you give yourself to God and you give him so much money, he will give you all this other money in return. That's not the gospel. What did Jesus gain when he came to this earth? Did he lack money? Did he lack comfort? Did he lack anything when he was there in heaven before he came down to this earth? No. The only thing he lacked was you and I, brothers and sisters, that he might become the firstborn of many brothers, it says in Hebrews. He wanted brothers and sisters. He was an only child. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that that begotten son of his who was an only child could have younger brothers and sisters and that's where you and I come in that's why Jesus came so that you and I could benefit I mean he he stood to gain nothing personally now I, I, I'm using an earthly analogy to explain a spiritual principle so I don't believe the analogy completely follows through however this is true that the only reason Jesus came was because he was living in obedience to the father and he loved us 
And He wanted to make a way of salvation for you and I. And that's why He took up His cross daily. That's why when He was tempted to lust at the age of 18 and 22 and 26 and 30, He didn't. Because He says, I, how can I do this and sin against my Father? That's the words of Joseph. That's the same attitude Jesus had. And if Jesus had sinned, I, I don't even want to think about it. But He came and He lived a sinless life, a pure life, so that you and I could become children of God. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become His righteousness. This is the gospel. This is not a, come and God will give you an extra car and multiply your money and you'll have health and wealth and He will heal all your sicknesses. No, He won't. He might allow you to die. He might allow some of your children to die or your brothers to die or your parents to die. You don't know what He's going to take you through, but you will have His righteousness. Nobody can steal that from you. Do you want that which nobody can steal from you? Because He might heal you of that sickness that you really want. He might give you that wife that you really want. He might give you that husband that you really want. But somebody might be able to take that away from you. There's something nobody can take from you. That's the righteousness of Jesus. If He's imparted it into your life through the Holy Spirit, nobody can take that from you. And that will last for all eternity. And as an extra, He will give you these things that you need. That's Matthew 6.33. Seek first God's kingdom. And I don't think it means, well, you go to church on Sunday and then live for yourself the rest of the week. I've heard that interpretation of that verse, where seek first, on Sunday you seek God's kingdom, and then God will give you all those things, which means I'll live for myself. No. I believe the, the meaning of what Jesus said is, seek first with that primary, only mentality. Seek God's kingdom that way, and see if God doesn't add these things that you need. To suffer so that others would benefit was the spirit in which Christ came to the earth and this is how we, His body, must live today. Is this how you're living today? I challenge you to. I believe many of you are. I believe it. I've heard your testimonies last year and even as I've talked to you already since yesterday. And I see that God is doing it little bit by little bit. And He's doing it in my life. He's doing it in our midst in this church here. And I believe He's going to do it more so in the year to come. Next year, if you come back, you'll have an even more powerful testimony of not all the great things you did and how you did this or went to this, did this missions trip and all that other thing. Those are great. I want to hear more of this. That Jesus showed me how I can live more for the sake of others. Abandoned to God for His purpose. And I lived and experienced more of that in 2013 and 2014, Santosh. When you come here next August, God willing, and you tell us that testimony, oh, it will rejoice our heart. Not just ours, it rejoices the Father who sees in secret. So you don't even have to tell me. You can keep it to yourself, and you know your Heavenly Father who sees in secret every time you have denied yourself and taken up your cross and died with Christ. If you fall into the ground and die, you will bear fruit. That's a promise in God's Word. John 12, 24. Take it to the bank. <clears throat> Turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Most of you know, know this verse, Romans 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Very popular verse in gospel meetings, in, in meetings where you're trying to convert somebody. He says, if you sin, you will die. And I, I want to be very clear that you understand that. If you're living in sin and you have no interest in living for God and you're just interested in pleasing yourself and living in sin, I'll give you God's word. I hate to say it, you will die. The penalty for sin is death. It'll come sooner or later. It's the very first warning God gave in the Bible. If you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. And mankind has been trying to disprove that. Mankind has been trying to find ways to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to sin and not die. Nobody has succeeded yet. And the only person that has been able to prove, who has been able to escape death, was Jesus who only ate of the tree of life and always did what the Father wanted him to do. Never did whatever he wanted to do. It was only what the Father wanted to do. He's the only one that escaped death. And even though they killed his body, it couldn't hold him in the grave. The life within him was too powerful for even a heavy tombstone to keep it locked down. And that's the promise he offers you, dear young brother, dear young sister. A life that's so powerful that they could put chains around you, it won't chain the word of God in you. They could lock you up in prison. You'll probably write a few letters that will bless a bunch of people like happened to Paul. 
They'll do stuff to your body and they'll do stuff to your house and to your family and, and, and they'll take all kinds of things away from you. But they will not be able to take that thing which God says you will keep. Romans 6.23 is the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sounds great. Unfortunately, because we live in a Christendom that has corrupted and polluted the Word of God, this verse is taken out of context. The only way you can understand this verse is if you read it in its context. Let's go back and read. Verse 22. Well, before that, 14, and you could read the whole chapter. Go back all the way to Romans chapter 1 if you want. Don't have time for that. But in Romans chapter 6, he talks about freedom from sin. Verse 14. Sin shall not be master over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. Sin is not your master telling you what to do all the time. You might fall into sin, but you're not always just listening. Sin says, oh, just, oh there's a pretty girl. Look at what she's wearing. Oh, you look over there. Oh, there's, there's an opportunity to uh, tell that, that crude story or, or speak harshly about somebody. Just go ahead and do that. But sin's not your master anymore because you're under grace. If you are under grace, sin is not your master. In that context, then he says in verse 22, Now... Having been freed from sin and enslaved to God. Now that's the part we want to skip over. I've been free. I was a slave to sin. I mean, I, we all know that. If you, every single one of you that's alive today was a slave to sin. Maybe you still are a slave to sin. I was a slave to sin for a long time, many years. I was a slave to sin. Sin told me what to do and I did it. Sometimes gladly, sometimes mournfully. But I did it because it was my master. I obeyed out of fear and out of pleasure maybe. Combination of both. So, but then thank Jesus, verse 22, look at this carefully. Thank you, Lord, that you died on the cross and paid the penalty for my sin so that now I'm no longer enslaved to sin. Now, having been freed from sin, well, what happened? Unfortunately, we live in a Christendom that is, that is preaching a gospel that draws people out of this enslavement from sin to left to do whatever they want. If you want the eternal life that's spoken about in verse 23, read verse 22 carefully. And let the Holy Spirit write it on your heart. Not my words. The words of God. Now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God. Are you God's slave? Are you the bond slave of Jesus Christ like Paul loved to call himself? When Paul introduced himself to somebody, he'd say, Hi, I'm Paul. I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Sounds funny. But that's the way he lived his life. Imagine you going up to somebody and says, Hi, I'm Santosh. I'm a slave. <laughs> What, what, what? You're a slave? I thought slavery was abolished. Yeah, I'm a bond slave of Jesus. R look at how he introduces himself. He's about to proclaim God's word to them. To all these episodes, many of them, he says, Paul, bond slave of Jesus. I'm proud of that title. He tells me what I do, and I just do it. In the same way that sin used to tell me what to do, and I obeyed it, now God tells me what to do. And he says, follow me. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. Not, oh, let me think about it, and I'll pray about it, and I'll do some fasting. Obey! having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, he goes on to say, that's how you get the benefit, which is sanctification and the outcome eternal life. Then the wages of sin is death, the free gift of God is eternal life. Yes, the, the eternal life that God promises you through Jesus Christ is free. You cannot earn it. You can't spend enough money or uh, go in any, any number of mission trips or uh, do any kind of acts that could earn this eternal life, but you must be a slave. And you must give yourself like a slave. And slave to God, we derive our benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life, which is free. And you'll get to the end of their life and you'll realize, I was just your slave, but you gave me the eternal life for free. So let's be clear, we're not earning this eternal life by being his slave. We owe it to him to be his slave because he purchased us. You know, in those days, when they paid a price for the slave, you belonged to your master like he owned you, like a car. Or like a chair. And he could kick you if you wanted. And, and, and treat you badly if you wanted. That's how they treated slaves. Because that was property. We are not our own. We have been purchased with a price. We belong to Jesus. That's the meaning of that. God's property. Now even the world has taken that and polluted that term I think. Without really understanding what that means. Where God holds me in his hand. And he's not going to kick you. He's not going to take advantage of you. He has your very best in mind. His plans for you are for your welfare. And the reason he wants to own you. And hold you in his hand. And treat you like his property. Is because he knows that that's the safest place for you. And the reason he's given you his commandments and his word. For you to obey. Is because he knows that that will give you the best possible outcome in your life. 
Now do you see him holding you in his hand and giving you stern commands and uh, uh, don't please yourself and don't love money and don't lust and, and don't get angry. All these things are for your good. These are the plans he has for you. Everybody's favorite verse these days, Jeremiah 29. I know the plans I have for you. Plans for your welfare, not for your calamity. Do you see the plans for your welfare, not for your calamity in the difficult circumstances in your life? In the frustrations, in the disappointments, in the not getting those things that you're longing for with all of your heart. I know the plans I have for you. You may not, I know it. And he wants you to take him at his word that he knows. He knows your name. He's your father. He's your maker. In that context, Oswald Chambers wrote this, the passion of Christianity. This is, if you, if you lack a passion in your life, press into this bond slave mentality. The passion of Christianity is that I deliberately sign away my own rights and become a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Until I do that, I do not even begin to be a saint. Do you want to be a saint? Do you want to have holiness in your life? Do you want to overcome? Do you want to experience the life of Jesus in you? Sign away your own rights. Give it away. You can't keep it anyway. Jim Elliot told us that. God's words told us that before that. You can't keep it anyway. Give it away now. You will either have to give it away now or give it away at the end of your life. Do it now so that you can gain that which nobody can take from you. I'd like to read one more poem in closing. I have two candles there. This is a poem by C.T. Studd, another man who lived like a soldier with abandon to his master. He wrote this poem, Only One Life. <clears throat> Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. This is one of my favorite poems. I love to read it any opportunity I get. So if you've heard me read it before, I'm sorry, you might hear me do it again. <laughs> I'm going to try to memorize it sometime. From my mind would not depart, only one life. It will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice. Gently pleads, make a better choice. Bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years. Each with its burdens, hopes and fears. Each with its clays I must fulfill. Living for self or in his will. Only one life it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore. When Satan would a victory score. When self would seek to have its way. Then help me, Lord, with joy to say only one life. It's nice to say it now, but will you say it at lunchtime, later today, and next week when you go back home? Help me with joy to say only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep. In joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whatever the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn. And from the world now let me turn. Living for thee and thee alone with abandon. Bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say it was worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. See, I think there will be people standing at the judgment seat of Christ when he returns with a candle in their hand and there will be some where, the, life, where, where the, uh, the candle of unselfishness the candle of abandon if you will is there and for most people in the world it will be full it didn't burn out at all 
C.T. Studd was one of those who made its goal in this poem that he wrote to be completely burned out, where there's nothing left. Was there one more command you wanted me to, me to obey? Was there one more situation you wanted to squeeze me through so that that candle could be burned out completely and give light to this world? Yes. I don't want to stand at the judgment seat of Christ with even a little bit of my candle left. I want to burn out. And it starts now. It starts now, my dear young brother, dear young sister. I wish I could impress this on your heart the way it's been impressed on my heart. And the way, I'll be honest, I wish I had taken it more seriously when I was your age. And I had people speaking to me exactly the same way as I'm speaking to you today. And there were mistakes I made, but I, I don't thank, thank God for His forgiveness and His mercy. And I'm thankful that He's gripped my heart with this passion now to burn out completely for Him so that there's nothing left. I hope it will be so for you as well. It can be so. This is what it means to have faith. Ask God to give you faith. Even a mustard seed side of size faith, if it's been planted in your heart, nourish it. Let it grow through the Word of God. Immerse yourself in this book. Immerse yourself in prayer. Devote yourself to prayer. Let God fill you with the Holy Spirit. And that little mustard seed side, size seed will grow into a tree. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, make it so. Watch over these dear young people, Lord. And I pray that this, the, the words they've heard already this morning, Lord, in the messages and through the songs and through the prayer time and all that you're going to do in their life and all the things you have done building up to this point, let it be so. Let it, let it propel them forward, Lord, to fulfilling, you're being able to fulfill your calling over their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lunch is ready.